throughout history, our approach to understanding nature could only really be best described as divide and conquer. We like to categorize phenomena as belonging to either physics, chemistry, or biology. A physics student thinks of neurons in the brain and might dismiss them as being topics for biologists. But by doing so, we're limiting ourselves. Because nature doesn't do this, it's indifferent to our attempts to fit it into categories. Instead of thinking, I'll leave the neurons to the biologists, we should be thinking, how can I use my skills in math and physics to look at the problem in a new light? As it turns out, this is exactly what's been happening in the physics community. Did you know there's a rapidly growing subdiscipline of physics called biophysics or neurophysics? How about econophysics? Medical physics? I wouldn't really blame you if you didn't know. I mean, I didn't really know until my PhD. These fields take an interdisciplinary approach to tackling problems in nature that are often passed over by the more traditional physics community. Now, while my plan for future videos is to talk about how this is being done, the mathematics involved and the techniques being developed, I think it's important we first establish why it took so long for physics to get here, and why math can be so hard to apply to real world problems. Traditionally, we have two broadly defined sets of mathematical tools with which to study difficult problems. On one hand, calculus and linear algebra lets us study deterministic systems using Newton's famous laws of motion. This is only feasible for a relatively low number of objects, however. So our other tool set, probability theory, treats nature as random in order for us to study many particles at once. By simplifying real-world problems so as to fit into one of these two approaches, we've been able to solve some really complicated problems and develop amazing technologies. But therein lies the issue. Because you see, real-world problems are not complicated. Instead, they're complex. Okay, now, I recognize that that sounds like I'm saying the same thing, but bear with me because there is an actual difference between the two. And the distinction isn't just semantics. Humans are good at working with complicated problems. We know how to break a problem down, study its simpler pieces individually, and build it back up again. This is more or less how science works in the modern world. But complex problems are fundamentally different. They occupy a gray area between our two main tool sets. Like bird flocks creating intricate shapes, complex problems have too much going on to be feasibly analyzed with Newton's laws and yet they contain too much structure for us to say that they are truly random. To understand the difference, let's, as an example, contrast the inner workings of a computer and a brain. Biology versus machines aside, these two share some superficial similarities. Both take in some input, process it, and then do something with that information. This analogy can be taken even further. For example, both utilize short-term and long-term memory storage. However, it's when we look at how these two accomplish their goals that the analogy breaks down and reveals the difference between a complicated process and a complex one. While computers seem intelligent, in reality, they're simply following instructions. These instructions are written into the computer's operating system, so think Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, and executed by the CPU, which globally coordinates the different parts of the computer. Really, the veneer of intelligence comes simply from the speed with which they are able to perform their relatively limited instructions. It's this algorithmic approach to executing a task that's a defining feature of complicated problems. In his book, It's Not Complicated, Rick Nason goes one step further to say that the difference between a simple problem and a complicated one is only the accuracy and precision the instructions require in order to complete the task successfully. Making a cup of coffee is simple, whereas filing your taxes is complicated, but ultimately both are completable by following a set of instructions. But the brain works differently. Like a computer, neurons in the brain coordinate to process information, that's true, but the big difference is that there is nothing telling them that they should do so. Instead, neurons follow their own individual rules, or what we sometimes call local rules. How we interpret our senses, emotions, movement, or consciousness in general is not encoded by any one individual neuron, nor is it encoded by any particular set of neurons. Instead, these are all emergent phenomena that are the result of many neurons assembling together of their own accord. 
These assemblies are flexible. A neuron that responds to vision may also respond to sound. It may even change what it responds to. This is how other senses can become enhanced for visually impaired individuals. Contrast this to a computer. Because of the rigid top-down instructions, a computer that receives the wrong set of inputs or has a component missing will simply stop working. This ability for individual agents, in this case neurons, to generate some emergent phenomena in spite of a central authority is the key pillar that distinguishes a complex system from a complicated one. But it's also why complex problems are so difficult to study. Whereas a complicated problem can be broken down into its individual parts, emergent phenomena produced by complex systems fundamentally cannot be. I find it useful to think of complexity as a puzzle. On its own, each piece of the puzzle is simple, and it's not obvious that there's any more to it than what appears on the surface. But by bringing together many pieces of this puzzle, an image emerges. An image that is not deducible from its individual pieces. This, in turn, is exactly why physics, and science as a whole, can be so hard to apply to complex problems. Because complexity goes against how we've trained ourselves to tackle difficult problems and the scientific toolbox that we've spent centuries developing. This was just one example, however. I chose it because of the brain similarities with computers, but complexity is really everywhere. No single bird can help you understand the intricate shapes of a flock in the same way that no single cell resembles the bird as a whole. Complex systems can arise from even human-made constructs. The internet routes and reroutes information independently and is not dictated by any one individual or organization. Even certain video games like Minecraft or Breath of the Wild exhibit some sort of emergent phenomena. Traders on Wall Street similarly follow their own local rules in order to maximize their profits and shield themselves from losses. This back and forth results in a highly complex stock market that can't be understood just by observing a single trader. In fact, the economy as a whole is an immensely complex system. And if you're around at the time of the publishing of this video and are hearing about supply chain problems, well, now you have an idea of how badly applying a complicated mindset to a complex problem can go. Because it's not clear how any one part contributes to the whole, problems that arise in complex systems are hard to rectify once something goes wrong. All of these are examples of systems wherein individual actors, following their own relatively simple rule sets, interact with one another in order to form something that is clearly much more than the sum of its parts. Complexity is inherent to them. It's what allows them to exist, even if it makes it hard for us to understand them. Like I said in the beginning though, we have made a lot of recent progress in understanding complex systems. Theoretical tools like network and graph theory, dimensionality reduction techniques, and statistical physics have all been key to understanding these problems. More powerful computers have allowed for larger and more complex simulations. In turn, we've been able to apply what we've learned about complex systems to control theory and neural networks and other problems. Engineers have also taken a similar approach by looking to biology to inspire new technologies. This is undoubtedly a great thing. By not limiting ourselves to what physics should be, we've opened the door to a whole new world of interdisciplinary research. I firmly believe that the next greatest scientific achievements will not be from physics or biology or chemistry, but rather from interdisciplinary sciences that blur these lines. Exploring how math and physics can be applied to these complex problems is what I hope to be doing in the next videos, so if you found this video interesting, I hope you'll join me for the next one.